This talk is about high-performance string processing scripts in Elixir, which is kind of kind of a mouthful, um, but it does sum up a lot of the components in this talk. It's mostly about string processing and how to optimize it. Um, uh, the script part is that we'll be looking at an underperforming script and make small incremental changes to it and see how that changes um, the execution time and also some other factors. Um, so I don't know about you, uh, but optimization, I, I just really love optimizing things. I just make, love making things go faster. And I know uh, we talk a lot about premature optimization. You know, it's the root of all evil. We've heard that, uh, I think, today. And um, sometimes, though, sometimes you get uh, these legitimate cases where something isn't working the way it should, and you need to make it faster. Um, this is one of those times. And besides, that doesn't really matter. This is a conference. We should have some fun, right? <laughs> we should indulge ourselves a little bit. Um, yeah, and I don't know about you. I, this, the, just this thing where you set up a benchmark, and you run your code, and you get a number. And that number tells you how good you are. And then, <laughs> and then you just you ch make a change, and you run it again. And then sometimes it's, it doesn't really make it faster, or it even makes it slower. And you've learned something, and that's good. But sometimes that number is lower, and that's just amazing. You get this like, rush of dopamine, and yeah, it's a good feeling. Um, my name is Joanna. I am a co-organizer of the Malmö Elixir Meetup. That's my Twitter and my GitHub. I work for a company called Castle. Uh, we do protection against account takeovers, uh, credential stuffing. We do security workflows, automation. Um, all kinds of stuff, and uh, we've got our headquarters in San Francisco, but we also have offices in Malmö, Sweden, and Krakow in Poland, um, and we are hiring. I have to say that. So let's talk about you, uh, the audience. You've at least been through the official documentation. You have an idea of what Elixir looks like, and maybe you've come across a couple of those. Uh, places where Elixir doesn't perform to the degree that you expect it. It might be performing worse than other languages with similar, uh, similar code. Um, and we'll be talking a bit about that. So this is the agenda. Um, first of all, I have to start with some, I think if you're doing a talk about optimization, you have to do some caveats. You have to say, you know, actually this is not good. You have to think about a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm gonna like, uh, check that off. Uh, to start, and then we can st stop caring about it. Um, and then I'm going to give you an introduction to the challenge, the script that we'll be working on. And then we'll be going in three different directions. The first one, try to just preserve the original script, but uh, make small, diff small changes to it, make it faster. And then we're going to take uh, a look at a different direction where we use more memory to make it faster, um, which is not always an option. And then finally, we're going to uh, go concurrent, because this is Elixir, so we should go concurrent. So I'm sure you've seen this quote. It's by Joe Armstrong. Um, I think it's from Erlangen OTP in action. I'm not 100% sure, though. And I see it as sort of a guiding light when it comes to optimization, when you're working, when you're building something. You know, focus on building something good first, and then actually take a look at, once you have it running, once you have it working, take a look at, do you, act, do you have any bottlenecks? If you have bottlenecks, that's the time to fix it. Uh, so, like I said, I want to talk a little bit about you know, how to do optimization. And this isn't the perfect method, but it's a couple of things to remember, to keep in mind while you're working. Um, and they're not in any particular order. Uh, so I think it's, it's very important to set a goal. If you have something that runs in 100 seconds, and that's too slow for you, how, how, how fast does it need to be? 
Is 10 seconds fast enough for you? Is one second fast enough for you? If you don't know where you're going, there, there's no way you're going to get there. Um, and you need to define a method. Uh, whether that's a benchmark, you can have like a, a micro benchmark. Those can be unreliable, but uh, easy to use. Um, if you're lucky, you can test it in production, but that's you know, dangerous. And then uh, you have to consider that you have to keep in mind the context. Uh, and by that, I mean, how much are you willing to pay to speed this up? If you can, you can throw resources at a problem, but it, like using twice as much resources often doesn't make it twice as fast. So how much are you willing to pay for 10% more speed? Um, and again, uh, using more memory can be a way to improve performance. But if you don't have more memory, that's not really an option. So let's, let's talk about the challenge itself. Uh, this talk started as a post on the forum. And um, it was about an underperforming script. And a bunch of people helped out. Uh, were uh, looking at it. Jose was looking at it. And um, there was just something about the script that really caught me. And I ended up spending so much time just modifying it, changing things. I started re-implementing core functions to see if I can make them faster. Um, I just spent so much time on the script that I ended up thinking, you know, I have all this information. I should put it somewhere. So I turned that into an article. And then it, it's a talk now. So the, uh, the script originally came from a blog post. From a, a, it was in German, but Google Translate did a pretty good job of uh, translating it. And uh, the task is to read from standard in. And this input is ASCII. It's about 1.8 million lines separated by spaces and new lines. Nothing complicated. And uh, you read from standard in, you split that into words, then you count the frequency of those words, you sort them, and you pretty print the output. Shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, so this blog post came with some uh, example implementations in different languages. And uh, I tried, I ran them all on my machine um, to compare. And I think the C version is interesting because we can look at it like a baseline. That's as fast as it's going to get. I don't think this necessarily is the best possible C version that has ever been written. Um, but we can use this as an indication of, OK, we should be probably within an order of magnitude of the C version. That's reasonable. We probably want to be faster than that. But yeah. And we can also see that this actually took something like 80 lines of code, while the, the article said that it should be something like 10. So it also, it also had a Python version, which um, eight seconds, that's pretty impressive to me. Eight seconds is super fast. It had a Ruby version, which, I mean, but still. <laughs> In the defense of Ruby, it, that, that this is fine. 70 seconds is fine. It depends on how often you write, you're running the script. You might need to do it in C. Um, that's not really the point, but it's, 17 seconds is kind of reasonable to me. It uses a lot more memory. I'm not really sure why. <laughs> and then we have the Elixir version. So this, um, this is uh, one that I wrote, but it's very similar to the one from the, the forum post. And I think this is, this is pretty good Elixir. It uses streams. It uses enum. It has this gorgeous, beautiful pipeline like all the way through it's just, that's aesthetically pleasing. Um, so let's walk through it. We start by creating a, a stream of lines. We use stream.flatmap and stream.split to turn the stream of lines into a stream of words. Then we reduce over that stream with uh, a map and update it to keep track of the count of each word. We then sort it by the count and pretty print it. And this takes 120 seconds in Elixir. So why is Elixir so slow? Let's, let's do audience participation. I'm going to name the different steps as I see them, and you can raise your hand where you think um, it's spending its time. It's fine to raise it multiple times. Um, so OK, first, reading. No one. OK, splitting. Really, no one. That's not where it's spending its time? OK. Oh, to the code. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you're going to go with flat mapping. All right, yeah. So, um, yeah, again, so, yeah, reading, split, uh, splitting. We, ha we had some hands. Okay, counting, counting the frequency of the words. People feel like that's the one. Um, how about sorting? Some people like that one, too. Okay. Uh, and then finally printing it. Some hands. So let's see how your intuition uh, does. This is where it spent time. Now, if you're paying a lot of attention to these numbers, um, they don't actually add up to 120 seconds. Because I wanted to split it by, by the different steps as I see them. And this was uh, using streams, which, of course, interleaves the function calls. I had to get rid of the stream. So I just uh, turned it into a list. And that made it a lot faster, um, about 30 seconds faster. Uh, and that's probably most likely uh, because of the overhead of streams. Uh, Jose has referred to it as the stream tax. You have to pay it if you're using it. Um, they have lots of other great properties, but they can slow your code, code down. Um, but yeah, we have, here we see uh, that reading took a little bit of time, spent some time reading, because it's reading lines. And that's, of course, more effort than just reading blindly. And uh, it spent a lot of time splitting and counting. So we know that those are the areas we need to, uh, to work on. So let's look at Elixir, the fast parts. That's uh, the, the cool part. Um, but first, uh, just a quick interlude. So if you're talking about Elixir scripts, what often comes up is the startup time. You know, it's not really fair to compare. Um, we can see that Python has a ridiculous startup time. That number doesn't make sense. Uh, Ruby, a bit more reasonable, and Elixir is slower. I think if you just keep running it, it, it uh, goes down to like 500 milliseconds. It's not crazy, and it definitely doesn't explain 120 seconds. And we also should uh, just briefly talk about runtime uh, performance versus developer performance. If you're here, um, you, you, can, you uh, enjoy the value of writing less and getting more from your code. Um, so when we're talking about performance string processing, we're not talking about beating Z. Uh, we're talking about having it at a reasonable uh, execution time. So first direction. Uh, so, uh, so Elixir data structures are immutable. And this is, a, this is a great thing. I love immutable data structures. They eliminate a whole class of, of bugs. They're excellent for concurrent programming. But they do have some caveats. They work in most cases. They're a great sensible default. But if you put too much data into them, they slow down. And that's what we've been doing now. Uh, like I mentioned, this was 1.8 million lines. I think it's something like 500,000 unique words. Um, that map does get slow. Um, but when a map is not fast enough, you've got options. Uh, so there's ETS, or Erlang Term Storage. It has super fast reads and writes. They're constant time meaning they, they, this doesn't get slower as you fill up the table. Um, and it's not garbage collected or anything. And this is what the ETS version looks like. It didn't really change a lot, except you now have that glaring, ugly hole in the middle of our beautiful pipeline. <laughs> uh, the first part is creating the table. We don't really need to pass any options. The defaults are fine. And we now use ETS update counter, which has a slightly arcane syntax with these tuples. Um, and then finally, tap to list to bring it back uh, as a list from the table uh, that we can then uh, sort and print. And this makes it three times faster. Just replacing the map with an ETS table made it three times faster. So lesson, maps are great, but they don't really scale with size. So next, let's talk about string splitting. That was the other big one. Um, String.split is this amazing function that just does what you want. It, looks, it just get, uh, splits on any white space. And by default, it get rid, gets rid of empty strings. But if you think about it, if we're splitting on every single white space, we're wasting a lot of effort, because we know that we only have spaces and new lines to care about. So uh, in most languages, you would look to regular expressions. Um, and here's a simple regular expression with a, a, a sigil that just looks at spaces and new lines. And this makes it slower. It makes it a lot slower. 
So regular expression uh, engines uh, are different in different languages. Some of them are really fast. Uh, V8 has a super fast one. Go, not that fast. Um, and Elixir or, or Erlang, not that fast either. Uh, but that's not really a problem for us because we've got another option. We have patterns. So as uh, the second argument to split, you can pass a string or a list of strings of things that you want to split on. And that does make it faster. We're now down to 30 seconds. And we, are, we, we um, proved our hypothesis. We could make it faster by reducing the white space that we split on. And you can improve this a little bit further by using binary compile pattern. Um, ironically, you can't actually compile a pattern at compile time. You have to do it at runtime. <laughs> and that shapes off another second. Not huge, but it's something. And then finally, we're going to look at Unicode. So Unicode support is not relevant for our script. Um, and Elixir, by default, cares about Unicode. And that has a certain overhead that comes with it. Probably another, a lot of the other implementations that, uh, in the other language, they didn't actually bother with uh, Unicode support. Uh, but again, it doesn't matter here. So instead of stream, we can use bin stream, which is Unicode unsafe. And that's also a considerable speed up just by dropping that. So we're down to 22 seconds. And the code looks like this now. Again, it's not that different apart from the unspeakable thing in the middle. <laughs> and here's the breakdown. Uh, we've improved the, the difficult areas. Splitting is down by half, reading as well. Uh, counting is, is, it looks really nice at six seconds. And um, yeah, this is pretty nice. I mean, ETS is really performing well here. But we can do better. So let's go in a different direction. Let's see what happens uh, if we use more memory to make it faster. And so streams are great when it comes to memory efficiency because you can produce values sort of lazily and handle them, and then they're released to be garbage collected. Uh, but calling split 1.8 million times, it's, so, it's a lot slower than calling it once with a 1.8 million times larger string. Uh, so we can, we can do something different. And again, like I mentioned before, getting rid of the stream itself makes everything faster. So here we use io.binstream again, but we pass the chunk size instead of a of line. And then we immediately turn it into a string. This is faster than using io.read, because uh, so io.read has an all option. Uh, but it uses a fairly small chunk size, so this is much faster. And again, we just split it once. And we don't even have to care about uh, setting up a pattern anymore, because splitting a single time is so efficient. And we're down to 16 seconds. So we beat Ruby, but we are using more memory than Ruby. <laughs> and we should talk about IO lists. IO lists are this really cool thing. So a lot of um, virtual machines have this built-in optimization for string con concatenation. And the basic problem is that if you're concatenating strings, let's say you have three, you first have to concatenate the two first, which gives you an intermediate one. And then you can concatenate the intermediate one with the third one, and you get an, uh, your final result. So you have to allocate five strings uh, to get your result. And um, what, for example, V8 does in this situation is that it doesn't actually make an intermediate string. It instead makes a list of all the strings that you try to concatenate. And then if you at some point try to look at the string, it turns that into a string efficiently. Um, uh, Java has an opt-in way of doing this with string buffer, uh, but from what I understand, the JVM can also do this magically behind the scenes. Uh, in Elixir, we do have uh, the option of opting into this behavior. So uh, there's a function called uh, Erlang IO list to binary, which turns a list of strings into a single string efficiently. And uh, furthermore, a lot of Functions uh, that concern I.O., they can take I.O. lists uh, natively. So I.O.puts, if you, if you pass a list of strings to I.O.puts, it actually just prints a single uh, string. And you can even nest these lists arbitrarily. And you can actually see this 
um, JSON, for example, the uh, JSON uh, library. It uh, has an encode to I.O. data option where it turns it into an I.O. list instead of a single string. And Phoenix, by default, uses this. If you do uh, plug register before send, you can inspect the payload before it sends it, and it's just this huge list of lists of lists of strings. And this uh, gets us down to 13 seconds. So this is pretty good. This is, uh, this is as far as I got, basically, for this. And this is what it looks like now. Again, there are not a lot of changes. We've mostly just replaced lines uh, with other things. It has some added complexity because it introduces new concepts. Um, but it, uh, the, f the flow of the code, what you're doing, is about the same as before. And here's the breakdown now. We don't really have any terrible parts anymore. We still spend a lot of time splitting and counting. But those are the... Uh, they don't look as bad as they did before. But we can, we can do better than this. We're using Elixir. We should be using concurrency to solve this problem. Um, the, the, the concurrency story in Elixir is, is great. We should be using it. So we can start with some simple concurrency with the flow library by platform attack. It uh, actually, in, if you look at the documentation for flow, one of the examples is counting the frequency of words. So this seems like the right thing to do. And it gets a little bit longer, not much. We have to pass um, some options to the ETS table public so that other processor, processes are allowed to write to it and write concurrency to optimize uh, m multiple processes writing at the same time. And then this is the part we change, which uh, basically we would replace stream or enum functions with flow. Otherwise, it's the same as before. And this, uh, again, is the, like the first version, because if you want to split work up, you have to have parts of work. Um, if you just make one huge string, you don't have parts to split up. Um, and this runs in 13 seconds. So it's as good as the, the final version, memory inefficient version we had, and it's kind of memory inefficient uh, too. And it also makes your computer very warm. <laughs> It, uh, uses, it uses all of my cores for 13 seconds. So um, I think Flow is a great library, but it, it might be overkill for this uh, specific script. But I mean, realistically, if we're, if we're saying that uh, Elixir is great for concurrency, the core library should have something for this. And it does in the form of task async stream. So this version of the script was originally written by Evadne Wu. Uh, she made this amazing version uh, of this script. And I stripped it down a little bit to make it easier to show. And um, if it's ugly or wrong, that's my fault. So uh, this is a bit longer. And it's actually as a module to re uh, reduce some uh, repetition. But I'll step through it you know, part by part. So we have this initial, the initial stuff with the table and pattern. Uh, and we create our input stream. And the new thing is that we create a task function that, is, that gets run by async stream. And this uh, async stream, just like flow, automatically parcels the work out onto as many processes as you have schedulers but by default, but you can also change that. So what we need to do is, if we look at the task function, is we need to split the, the input, that, which is a chunk in this case, um, and split it by words. And then we have to call process words. And what process words does, uh, we'll be looking at that a bit later, but what's interesting here is that we're working with chunks and not lines. And a chunk doesn't know where a line starts or ends. So we have to keep track of the beginning and end of every chunk so that we can glue them back together um, later. So uh, next step is, wait, sorry, processing words. So. Um, this, uh, let's start from the bottom. This is the final case. There are no more words, and we return the, the, the prefix and the suffix as a tuple. So the async stream, basically uh, the one that we just looked at, it turns the stream from chunks into prefixes and suffixes. Uh, and the, f uh, the first case is where there is no prefix, and there's, we grab the first item from the list of, of words, 
and we keep it as the, the, the prefix. And then we do the same thing for a suffix if it's the last item in the list. And then finally, uh, any other word, we can just count it. And then, now that we've done that, we're at the next part, we have to actually glue those uh, words together, which we do by transforming the stream here at the end. This is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, you just glue them back together. And then we have the uh, final part. We finish up the work, which looks about the same as before. And this finishes in seven seconds. So that's pretty good. That's pretty impressive. And the memory usage is not that bad either. It's a lot more work than the original version. It's not 10 lines anymore. But I still feel like I probably wouldn't want to write this in Python or Ruby. So to do a quick recap, we talked about optimization. Um, we worked through the examples with small incremental changes. We talked about these changes, what they did, and how they affected the execution time. We looked at some alternatives to the standard tools. Um, we explored trade-offs like memory usage, and finally applied concurrency to the problem. So the takeaways. Elixir has sensible defaults. We've got Unicode safety by default. We've got um, immutable data structures by default. It has great defaults. But when they're not enough, there are options. And that's my talk. Thank you.